<coughs> okay, right. What I want to do is to introduce you to what's going to happen a bit this year and what this module, Sustainable Information and Corporate Governance, is all about. <coughs> one of the interesting things is we are one of the very, very few universities with a module on governance as part of IT or analytics. That's partly because of my background, partly because of my interests, uh, and because it has such an enormous impact on what's going on. And what we'll be looking at, I mean, you looked a little bit a couple of years ago in IT services management, or last year for some of you, uh, at some of the failures of IT and some of the causes of failure, and uh, that's what we're going to be looking at um, mainly this year. We'll also be looking at not just IT governance, but also what happens when the world of uh, corporate governance fouls up a bit. And we've seen an astounding number of those fa failing over the last uh, few years. And interestingly, <coughs> I'm sure many of you know that I get, get involved with business conferences, and I'm doing a couple over the next month, uh, about the impact of big data on the governance um, and on software testing and how testing uh, impacts upon success rates. So the module Sustainable Information Corporate Governance and what we're going to do in terms of delivery is we will have, we may end up with one big session like this for an hour, hour and a half, two hours um, working together, looking at some of the big ideas, doing some research, and then in the workshop, or workshops if we end up with two, which we might well do, um, then that's where you start applying what you've learned in the sort of seminar session, which is this one, into your preparation and research for solving your um, assignment that you'll be getting. And like always, Somewhere around week eight or thereabouts, well, we won't have any sessions in here, you'll come up to my room and you'll have your usual formative uh, feedback session uh, with the rubric and everything else and then you've got until just after Christmas when we'll do the same sort of schedule through my office uh, the first week of January, January 3rd or 4th I think it is, and that's when they'll be marked. So that's why it's kind of called blended face to face because that's what's happening because you've got these face-to-face -face sessions and the workshops where I and my colleague here, uh, Winnie McKindy, who is um, going to be helping on the tutorials and because uh, she's got an interest in governance and she's just finishing off her PhD at the moment and that looks at things like, uh, you said it was social media and how kind of reliable it is or isn't which we already know from the work you did with your ICS and uh, in ITSM. Um, social media are kind of a bit random in what they actually do. <coughs> now we know that modern companies are getting really hooked on big data. All this massive amount of data sitting out there somewhere in their own corporate data stores in Twitter and elsewhere. And we know also in the work you did last year with uh, some on ITSM, you saw that Standish Group record uh, data shows that IT is remarkably um, value destructive. It's only about less than 30% of IT-related projects are on time to budget and deliver some benefit to the business, and the rest are challenged or fail. And it's really quite interesting that companies continue to think about we're going to be successful. We're going to make, we're going to be like those 5% of companies who are up there in all the conferences telling us that we can get 5% improvement, 10% improvement on our turnover, our profit, or all these things. And most people are not going to be successful. <coughs> and so we're going to be looking at things like corporate governance, information security. We're going to look a little bit at IT law. We're going to look at some corporate and information strategy, things to do with uh, building what you did in ITSM about effective and successful delivery of projects, particularly IT projects. We'll be looking a little bit at ethics, because that's becoming more and more important. Otherwise, you end up like uh, Target company did a few years ago, 
uh, when they kind of decided that they would use big data to tell them something and then the sky fell in a little bit later when they used that in a rather uh, inappropriate sort of fashion. How many remember Target? And what I said about Target? No. Target is one of the largest supermarket chains in the, in the USA. A little bit behind um, Walmart, but they are very, very big. And back in 2000 and about 12, their marketeers realized that there's this huge amount of data out there that they're capturing through the, their uh, customers' credit card related records, through their uh, loyalty card type of data, through all sorts of other data that they could buy in from elsewhere. Things they probably couldn't have bought in under the European uh, data protection regime, but they did. And they worked on something that most marketeers, most retailers know is that uh, women who are pregnant tend to have rather plastic preferences and so on. And they decided to put a, pose a challenge to their big data analysts team. And the challenge was, from purchasing patterns and changing purchasing patterns, can you identify women who are pregnant? The big data analyst team rushed off and thought, hey, this is cool, really interesting sort of stuff. Let's get all that data that we can get hold of and then see whether we can. And it turned out, after a little bit of effort, that they could identify not just the trimester that the woman was in, they could always identify pregnant women, and which trimester, and towards the end, they could identify the month that the baby was due. Huge sort of, sort of hurrah, which is fantastic. Uh, and they called in think, uh, journalists from sort of places like Washington Post and, uh, and so on, the New York uh, Times. I said, this is what we're doing. Come into our data center and come and see our analytic uh, capabilities and see what we've been able to do. Isn't it fantastic? Then the marketing team decided that this is something they can really use thoroughly because what they knew was that people went into Target with a fairly narrow perspective. I'm going to go to Target to buy my vegetables or my groceries and vegetables or I might go there to buy clothes, or I might go there to buy gardening things or so on. And what they knew was, the marketeers knew that from lots of other research, that if you can get people to actually realize that there's a much broader range of things there, and particularly if they're women in this sort of plastic preferences mode, they will then become really, really, really regular loyal customers for the future. And so they started sending out booklets of uh, money off vouchers and so on. Now, they didn't just put vouchers for you know, the things you need for babies and nest building and so on, but they added a few extras so it wasn't quite so obviously creepy and targeted at the, girl, the, the women and girl, the young girls. And they thought this was real cool and it was a fantastic success. Until one day, a very, very angry man turned up at one of the stores, demanding to see the manager. She finally came down and uh, came to see him. <coughs> and the father said, this, this man said, What are you trying to do? Trying to get my daughter, who's 16, pregnant? Look at these, all these money off discount vouchers for things to do with babies and, and nest building, etc. Oh dear, sir, he said, I'm ever so sorry, I don't know anything about this at all. But I'll go and see if I can find out what's happening, and then I'll, I'll phone you back next week as soon as I know anything. Next week, the Matt store manager phoned this man, this father, and said, I'm ever so sorry, I've not really been able to find out an awful lot, but uh, I'm terribly, terribly sorry about the fact that your, your daughter got targeted with this book of vouchers. And the father said, ah, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have to apologize. <clears throat> there were things going on in my family that I didn't know about. And it turned out the young 16-year-old lass hadn't quite got round to screwing up her courage to explain to her mum and dad that um, I'm going to be grandparents shortly. Now, that was one incident. There were several others, uh, including where emails went to various customers and partners. Uh, male-female partners 
sharing similar, sharing the same email address, started getting these, and sometimes the bloke read the email before the wife or partner had read it. And this was the first he'd heard of the fact that she was pregnant. And sometimes it was a woman was the first she heard of that she was pregnant and discovered that actually, yeah, she was. Are you in the wrong module or something? Uh, no, I'm not in this class. Ah, right. And so the sky fell in. And a year later, at a big, a big conference, one of the big conferences I go to in Las Vegas with IBM, um, which I'm going to in a few weeks' time, <coughs> was, was where they were talking about this. And it came that the, uh, the marketing team and everybody else at Target closed down the whole thing. No more um, access <coughs> by the journalists, the data science team. Uh, no, it never ever happened. Unfortunately, you can actually go and find out there in the newspaper um, repositories the actual original articles that they wrote about this fantastic uh, activity. Now, this raises huge questions about the ethics of what we should be investigating and what we should be doing at a corporate level with that knowledge we have pull together about our customers. Are there, and we'll, cut, we'll discuss this a bit later on, are there questions that we should not even be asking of our data as a matter of ethics? Or is it that we can ask the question of the data, but then the ethics comes in with what we do with that new knowledge we've got? So did, was the ethical failure, the government's failure in target to do with doing that experiment or that analysis, or was it in the fact they then went out and started targeting their customers with that knowledge? Technically they proved it. Hmm? Technically they proved it worked. They proved it worked, and therein was the danger. And you won't find any, I don't think you'll find any retailer doing that sort of targeting again. Use the word targeting twice. Now, we've got an awful lot of use of private cloud, public cloud, and hybrid cloud. We're using, we're finding an awful lot of debates about who owns our data. Where are the ethics? Where are the laws? What do they say about the sort of data that is being collected? Things like those boxes that go in the back of your car that for your insurance. Um, that you can be used by, particularly by younger drivers, to get better uh, insurance rates because you drive well. Who owns that data? Is it you? Is it the owner of the box that collects the data? Is it the insurance company? Or if you look at the modern high-end cars, they're busy collecting all sorts of data about your driving characteristics and going back home, emailing that back home to BMW or whoever owns the, uh, made that car so they can find out how cars are really driven by real people as opposed to their test drivers or their assumptions. Who owns that data? How do they work out whether it's me driving or my wife or when you're driving my car with my permission sort of thing? How's all that going to work? And we see an awful lot nowadays of third-party providers being part of the value chain of the compute chain for all sorts of use of analytics. We're seeing more and more things collecting on here, and apparently, as I read this morning, there are apps you can put on your smartphone which actually track your driving cap uh, characteristics, where you accelerate exceedingly rapidly and then break exceedingly violently and, and all sorts of things like that. And they can even determine which side of the car you're getting into to work out whether you're the driver or the passenger. Is this a good idea? Over the last couple of years I've had groups working on location services and the accuracy of location services on smart devices, their dissertation projects. And we've got a really great one coming up this year if you want it to be supervised by me, which is looking at something slightly different but related. 
Now, we know from the work that we've done for the last couple of years, these aren't terribly accurate. There's some work done by a company called Think Near over in the States, which suggests that something like 10% or 12% of all location services based or targeted adverts are in identifying places by more than 60 miles error. Now that raises interesting vulnerability questions of me getting a bit hacked off by Costa or whoever who is sending me, by the way, you've got a beautiful, you're just passing our um, store in um, Derby and um, we've got a discount for you and you are actually in Sheffield and I've seen this happen. I start getting upset that I'm getting effectively spam adverts because this is recording where I am incorrectly. I mean, I've had this telling me where I am out by 1800 kilometers. Mostly, much less, but uh, it's got quite a few in interesting large errors. And so as all of this, we need to start thinking in terms of corporate governance to think about what we're trying to do, what we want to do, rather more carefully. Otherwise, we're going to get ourselves into trouble like Target or uh, these other people using these gadgets to target their adverts at you. Now, we know that IT, if it's properly done, can build greater efficiencies into our organisations and with the coming of an really good analytics, give us some really rather cool insights which you'll be looking at with Dennis in Emerging IT Product Development, which I guess starts this week as well. And you'll be using some very, very interesting um, software to do that. Some of the best software in the world that IBM have given us. And so, one of the questions, again, that comes back to what Nick Carr said many years ago and has written about over the last few years, is that IT now is essentially a utility. Whether you're using world leading edge software like Watson Analytics, which you'll be using in, I, in the ITPD um, or in other modules, all these sort of things, it's to do the software is effectively a utility. Everybody has access to it, and the thing that makes us different from our competitors is how we actually harness this utility. It's like electricity. It's a utility, or water's utility, or gas. You don't expect to get a business benefit purely by using electricity, gas, and water, or even the internet. It's what you do with it. And so we begin, we'll be looking at that as well. Now if you look back, look at this one here. If you go back 30, 40 years, um, mid-60s, a bit further back than that, American Airlines and IBM created the Sabre um, computerized reservation system. Huge effort in then money, about $5 million, today's money, $50 million perhaps. And for 15 years, that set American Airlines sort of ahead of every other airline. Then IBM, with their 15 years of experience, re-engineered Sabre and created a new one, which they then started licensing out to many, many other airlines around the world. And American Airlines, because of all this customized stuff they'd done with Sabre, found it very difficult and impossible, in fact, to switch from Sabre to the new one. Suddenly, all of their competitors were on an effectively level playing field, or even a little bit further ahead than they were. And today, if you look at Big things like enterprise resource planning systems, ERP systems, or whether it's analytic systems like SAS or Watson Analytics, even Tableau. They're all standardized systems that do things. The same things for everybody. And the only way you get an advantage over your competitors that works into the long term is if you are using those insights more cleverly than your competitors. So we'll be looking at some of these aspects as well. A little list of some of the more interesting catastrophes of failures of governance over the last 5, 10, 15 years. 
lots and lots of risks relating to use of IT, whether it's mainframe, apps, analytics, what, whatever it is. One of the things that comes out of all of this is that we always tend to think, because of the press, that financial services are the worst, most value destructive industry in the world. Because, you know, we had the credit crunch and they wiped, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 trillion uh, dollars worth of value off their shareholders, maybe more. IT, at its lowest estimate, is able to destroy something like half a trillion dollars, 500 billion dollars of value a year. <coughs> on, this, on the most aggressive uh, version, which I tend towards believing is a more accurate one, it is about six trillion dollars of wasted expenditure, wasted resources. And the world only has a GDP, a gross domestic product, of about 65 to 70 trillion dollars a year. So IT is capable, both because of the failures of, IT, of the software, the limitations of the software that's implemented, the fact that we all have to do all sorts of workarounds to, to actually get our job done. And those of you who were out on placement last year will probably have seen how lots of IT need, was supposed to solve a problem and then causes you to do more and more and more other things just so that the job can get done. And that extra effort is included in that six trillion dollars. The most value destructive industry perhaps in the world. Kind of interesting when we sell IT as a great benefit. The thing that makes work, the life easier. When was the last time you found IT made your life easier? I can order something overnight with Amazon Prime and get it delivered tomorrow. That's nice. Calendar's on your phone. Pardon? Calendar's on your phone. Calendar's on your phone. That mostly works quite well. Internet banking on your phone. Yes. Do you trust it? I do, because I've only got the one. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there are parts that actually do work. And when it works, it's kind of cool. But there's an awful lot of things that don't work terribly well. I mean, talking to lots of colleagues, lots of people at the IBM conference in Vegas over the last two, three years, uh, who've got long-term experience of IT like I have, people like Dave Voorhis. You know, our perspective is IT today, the apps we have on here, quite a lot of the software we have on our PCs and on our mainframes, is less reliable than we have ever seen it. I mean, how many, if you go into updates on here, anytime you go into your app store, you're liable to find maybe half of your apps need an update every month, every two months. Why? Why should there be that many every month? Mostly to fix security problem or something that didn't quite work and we're rushing out the next fix because we didn't actually test it terribly well and we hope we haven't added a new little problem that breaks something else. I mean I was looking at iOS 10 uh, on uh, seven, uh, iPhone what 7. What is with that home thing? Oh, I don't know. I've no idea. I don't know why they think it's a good idea given the sort of usage that people use make of these. You know. A lot of people have to charge these twice a day. Depends and on what you're using for. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know, but there's a lot of people who use them so heavily for phone calls, for business and so on, they need to charge them two, three times a day. That means you can't be having a phone call with your in-ear uh, wired um, headset because you don't want to spend 159 bucks buying their lovely new uh, uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth headset, which only lasts five hours on the charge anyway, and hang on, five hours and it's 20 hours a day sort of thing. Or you're on your flight, and it's a 10 hour flight, or more than five, I mean you can't go across the Atlantic on one charge of the new air headsets. Bonkers! So what we're going to be looking at is a whole set of questions and frameworks that you will, be, will find enormously valuable in looking at a particular context, any context, finding out the interesting questions that you need to ask, i.e. that problem identification I talked about uh, on Friday at the induction, 
And then you can look at your projects, you can look at your data, you can look at every, all sorts of aspects to see how you can be a bit more successful. Because what your job today, well this year is, is to become more effective as IT and analytics experts than most of those who are out there already. You can become valuable to future uh, employers because you understand how things interact. You understand how to find out really good questions and then quite good answers about the project, about the data, and so on. And next semester in uh, Enterprise Systems and Emer uh, Information Security and Insurance, you'll be looking at extending the current 12, 13 Vs of big data and project governance to a few more, if you can find some more interesting words beginning with V, that help you to ask more interesting questions. Because many of the people who publish all of these analytical frameworks, whether it's ISO 27000 series, whether it's the ISO 3100, uh, and, 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 lots and lots and lots and lots of governance framework, project management frameworks, um, ways of doing, uh, sets of um, analytics, functionality and capability and most people will be teaching will be teaching you those that these are the answers if you do 27001 I say 27001 then you will be successful in information governance no because it's tick 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 and mostly we can tick 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 and pass the um, the questions quite easily and still make no change in our ability to do things right what we need to do is actually use these frameworks as a way of asking questions. Come back to what I told you in ITSM and the Intro to Computer Science, I don't teach you question answers. I only teach you questions. Because every scenario is different, the context is always slightly different or big, uh, different in major ways. You need to work out what the differences are. You need to work out what are the most important questions that will lead you to a successful project. And that's what we're really going to do here. And it will link back to IT services management and it will connect across to what the other modules you're doing this semester this year in terms of merging IT product development, advanced analytics, enterprise systems, um, and so on. And that will give you a really rounded understanding of how to become effective at running projects, at effective at being a data analyst, a data scientist, and actually able to make a bit of a difference when you go out into the big wide world next year to be able, because you understand where all the problem points are and how to perhaps, how perhaps to actually get around them and do better. So at the end of the module, these are the three learning outcomes. You'll be able to critically evaluate issues of sustainable governance in the context of the development and evaluation of information strategies. You'll be able to critically evaluate the impact, the sustainability, and the risks related to the introduction of emerging technologies and business practices, including the questions of ethics and compliance. And you will be able to develop and justify an appropriate sustainable information governance strategy for an organization. And those all come together in the assignment and in the uh, marking scale as I shall show you in a short while because that links to the SOFIA framework which is the skills for an information age to the various levels from uh, the bottom to the top and you'll see that uh, shortly. We'll cover things like the um, law aspects applying to the UK uh, corporate uh, governance, the ISO 27000 series of standards, and the one that we work with most is 27002, which is a set of 180 or so individual questions 
that you ask yourself as an organisation based on the risk assessment that you've undertaken beforehand to identify what is most risky for you. And it's that that provides the scalability that allows you to use ISO 27000 for a single person all the way out to a million person organisation. We'll think a little bit about the value of IT, the value of information, the value of knowledge, uh, connecting to people like uh, Strasman and Paul Strasman and uh, Brynjolfsson, who've done a lot of work about the fact that IT, although it has provided a lot of benefits and efficiencies uh, in white goods, electronics, uh, and the sort of manufacturing area, it is incredibly difficult to identify any bottom line benefits for white collar office activities. It's really quite magical. You can see, uh, we'll in, I'll introduce you to a whole series of slides that show just why it's so complicated. And so it also raises interesting questions about were they measuring the value of IT in the most appropriate way? We'll look at the Standish Group research. Uh, we'll think of, uh, there's a lovely book down the library by a guy called Shibura, called From Control to Drift, that looks at how IT over the years has looked at the concept of corporate strategy and has it worked? Does it actually deliver what the man senior management are wanting to deliver? Then we'll sort of step back from some of these or rather grandiose and magical big frameworks and analyses and start thinking sensibly, pragmatically. Because an awful lot of what goes wrong with IT, whether it's in terms of security uh, or whether it's in terms of project failure, over-optimistic uh, targets and so on, is because of human factors. The way that we as humans actually behave compared with what some of the assumptions are. We'll look at the role and value of ethics and an ethical approach uh, in terms of governance, of information, in terms of corporate governance in a collect connected and globalised environment where everything is connected. We're all connected around the world. And then we need to think about sustainable computing both in the green sense and in the long-term value that it delivers to an organisation. Then we look at a bit more of the UK law, we look at corporate social responsibility and its impact on reputation or lack of, and we think about project management. And we think about not just risk in its usual sense, but also in terms of uh, uncertainty management and benefits management. So there's lots and lots of aspects. Lots of technologies that we're involved with and the basic stuff you know about. And it's a single assignment. I, the assignment is set as a broad topic area and you will each research to find an area that is of real interest to you. All of these are on the, up on the system already, all these slides. All of the material is already on Blackboard. Um, I'll introduce you to the assignment in a few minutes. There is a reading list here, and some, most of the books are in the library. And there are also examples of previous types of assignments already up on the um, internet. There's a sort of published books, e-published books, for one or two years. I forget which years there are or what we've done. So you, some of these books will contribute. What I'm actually much more interested in, these provide some of the unchanging um, so ideas which haven't changed in 10, 15, 20 years. Because IT, although it moves on very, very fast, so the answers change almost daily, monthly. The questions today that chief information officers and all the CXOs are asking about IT and communications are actually the same questions as have been asked for the last 40, 50 years. When I started at Rolls-Royce in 19, after university in 1973, 4 or thereabouts, as a systems analyst, 
the sort of things we're looking at here are typically the same, fundamentally the same questions that we've been looking at for 40, 50 years. Very little has changed in terms of the questions. And so these books do provide some of that, but what I want you to be thinking about even more as your reading or research sources is to find, connect yourself to uh, a lot of the very, very modern stuff. Like I mentioned last year and the year before, you know, Computer Weekly, Computing, Tech Republic, and, and, and. They provide you the feed every day, every week, of the most interesting questions, the most interesting <coughs> consequences of what's happening today. How many of you are connected, are already on LinkedIn building your connections? I would strongly recommend all of you to connect on LinkedIn, or get yourself a profile on LinkedIn, connect to me, and also connect to a lot of the um, <coughs> daily or the main um, article sections. There's, there's Pulse, there's technology, there's big data analytics, and so on. And they are interesting people writing about things that are touching them personally, or their company, or they're observing about law, about ethics, about big data, about technology, all sorts of things that keep you right up to date. We'll talk a bit more about use of value of LinkedIn for each of you um, during the year because it will be very, very valuable for you to get a job in the future if you, if you manage your profile carefully. So I'm looking more for your research as you develop your assignment and your understanding week by week of the various topic areas that you are not restrained, restricting yourself to here other than for a few questions and a few insights but also all of that online stuff because if you look at the reputable press um, the good science, IT, big data they are the things that are currently keeping Chief Information, Chief Security Office, Chief, Chief Data Officers and so on awake at night. They are the leading edge and your assignment will be the leading edge. So you will be do, using the internet as a sort of your major source as long as you keep away from the wikis. You are not allowed to cite wiki something ever. Not for anything. You can have a look at it just to get a feel but then you go off and find the real stuff. Any questions about the module, folks? So it seems sort of vaguely interesting, perhaps? As long as you keep awake. <laughs> okay, right, well, I'll switch it off and then switch it back on again in a second.